here to talk about API authorization. A little bit about myself before we start. Um, I've been doing software for developers for well over 30 years. Uh, I helped uh, co-found the .NET team back at Microsoft. Later on, uh, the Azure project as well, where I was the general manager for a bunch of teams, but one team that was, uh, became the Azure Active Directory team. That's where I got my taste for identity and access. Um, and over the last, you know, I would say 12, 13 years, I've been working in the open source world. Uh, first on things like OpenStack and Cloud Foundry, later on on Kubernetes uh, and Puppet. And uh, I love startups. Asserto is my third one. And when I'm not startuping, I'm skiing. And I'm actually really sore that uh, Park City is opening one week from Friday. So I'm missing it by a week. All right. So first, a uh, little primer. Who knows the difference between authentication and authorization? All right, I won't have to belabor this point. Most people call this auth and don't differentiate. Authentication is, did the user prove that they are who they say they are? Back when I started in this industry, it was always a user ID and a password. Now it's like magic links and you know, pass keys, biometrics, and so on and so forth. Um, whereas authorization is, what can the user do inside of your application? What permissions do they have now that they're logged in? Authentication, fairly mature space. Again, uh, you know, 20 years ago, we had SAML. Uh, some of my teams worked on SAML back when I was at Microsoft. Uh, we've had uh, OpenID Connect for 11 years now, OAuth 2 for about 15, mature space. And you have a set of developer services that make it so that you don't have to build authentication. You can choose Cognito or Auth0 or Okta or uh, Azure Active Directory. This is a solved problem. Whereas authorization, not a solved problem. So what are the standards for authorization? What's the open ID connect for authorization? Anybody? There's none, right? Uh, now, a hat tip to a talk that I'm giving tomorrow, which is called Open ID Auth Zen, the open ID connect of authorization. Uh, we're trying to actually go build uh, a standard like open ID connect for authorization, but it's still obviously in its infancy. Developer services, anybody can tell me what is the auth zero of authorization? Nobody, because there isn't any. There are half a dozen startups like ours, uh, like Asserto, that are trying to go build one of those things. But again, it's an early space. So the bottom line is that everybody has had to build their own. Everybody rolls their own. And there are a bunch of problems associated with that. First of all, first and foremost, bad security. I'll get back to that in a second. The second is, as you roll out a microservices architecture, you have a bunch of inconsistency. Every microservices does it differently. Super hard to wrangle all that complexity. And then the third is opportunity cost. You're doing a bunch of undifferentiated heavy lifting, building authorization into each one of these APIs or applications instead of using something off the shelf. And back to security, um, don't take my word for it. The OWASP, which is the organization that looks at all the vulnerabilities in web applications, ranks broken access control as the number one on their top 10 list of vulnerabilities. Uh, they estimate that a whopping 94% of the applications that they test exhibit some form of broken access control. So a real problem. Now, it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, we finally are seeing the you know, moment for authorization, starting with all the tech companies. So Google back in 2020 wrote a paper called Zanzibar, which was a seminal paper. It's kind of like the MapReduce paper, but for authorization. And in it, they describe how they do authorization for all of the Google properties, like Google Docs, Google Drive, you know, Google Calendar, uh, Cloud, and so on and so forth. A bunch of other companies followed suit. So Airbnb wrote about theirs, Intuit, Netflix, Uber, Reddit, Carta, they all wrote about their authorization uh, systems. And we've now been able to glean some patterns and in our attempt to democratize it for everybody else. So let me contrast what we call cloud native authorization against what the current state of the world is or the traditional or old school authorization across three axes, the what, the how, and the when. So what you're authorizing in, course, in, in uh, traditional authorization is typically a tenant. You're a viewer on a tenant. You, that means that you have access to all the resources in the tenant. You write the enforcement logic using if and switch statements that basically look at scopes that you've stuck in your access token and figure out whether you know, like that particular user has that scope. If they don't, then you uh, deny the operation. And you do the cat, like you figure out whether the user is authorized or not at login time. 
right? So like during login, you know, you figure out what scopes to put in an access token. And then that token is good for a couple hours or a couple of days. And that user has that permission because that user has a bearer token. Um, the cloud native version of this is fine grained, policy based and real time. I'm going to repeat those words a lot in this presentation. Fine grained means meaning not at the tenant level, but at the resource level. Does this user have this permission on this document? Right? Policy-based, meaning we're extracting all those if and switch statements out of the application logic and expressing them in a domain-specific language. Um, and that enables separation of duties. And then lastly, real-time, we want to make sure that permissions are evaluated right before you grant or deny access to a protected resource. Continuous enforcement. So let's go into these three things in a little bit more detail. So the evolution of fine-grained access control. I'm old enough to remember the 80s where we had Unix systems and you had nine bits on the resources that you authorized. Those resources were files or inodes. Uh, and so you had read, write, and execute bits across user, uh, group, and other. And that was all of the scope, all of the fine-grainedness that you had on authorization. Uh, everything was a file, so that was your system and you were kind of stuck with it. Uh, it was kind of complicated because auditing every file that users had access to was like not really a practical matter. Um, from that, we had, we, uh, had an evolution into RBAC, role-based access control, where the idea was you had a directory like an LDAP directory or active directory that had a bunch of groups and users had um, you know, were members of those groups. And typically in a business application like SAP, you figured out whether the user had a particular role by asking whether it was a member of an LDAP group. Um, it helped, but it turned out that um, you had what's called role explosion in that world. When I left Microsoft in uh, 2011, we had 100,000 employees. Anybody venture a guess on how many groups we had when I left Microsoft? 300,000. Very good guesses, very good guesses, but it was impossible to know who had access to what. Out of that came the fine-grained approaches. So in the 20, 2020 2010s, you had ExactMole, which represented the, uh, you know, the, the new world of attribute-based access control. ExactMole was a sister spec to SAML, but uh, who have, has heard of ExactMole? No one. Exactly. Oh, one, one person. Excellent. Because ExactMole didn't exactly take the world by storm, but the idea was you have attributes on users, attributes on resources, you could write a policy. And so this worked if you had things like top secret attributes on a resource, on a document, and a top secret clearance, you could match that up and figure out that this user, yes, had access to that document. The problem was that most applications didn't share attributes, so you had attribute explosion. And finally, you have what's called the relationship-based access control model, which is what Google repopularized with its Zanzibar paper. And the idea there is that you model um, these uh, subjects and objects as a graph, and you evaluate permissions based on uh, relationships between subjects and objects by walking that graph and finding a path that carries that permission between the subject and the object. So uh, does Eve have access to this document? Well, Eve, if Eve is in this group and this group has viewer access to this folder and this document is inside this folder, then yes, Eve has access to this document. We'll get back to ABAC and ReBAC later because those are the main uh, ecosystems within the cloud native authorization world. But first, let's talk about policy-based access control. Uh, so the idea here, as I said, is lifting access control logic out of the application and expressing it in its own domain-specific language. Here I have uh, an example of an OPA policy. I hope people can see this. Uh, OPA has a language called Rego. Uh, it is the surface syntax for OPA and Topaz. And this policy basically says, allow the operation if the uh, user's department property is operations. Super simple policy. Uh, but what that enables you to do is take all of those if and switch statements out of your code and instead encapsulate them in middleware that can call an externalized authorization processor and answer to the question, does this user have this permission on this resource? Um, and it gives you a bunch of benefits. Uh, you can store and version a policy just like application as code. This is why this is called policy as code. Every policy change is part of a git log, uh, change log, a git change log. 
The policy can be evolved separately by uh, a team that can reason about all of the dif different policies for all the microservices. And finally, you can build these policies into immutable images. You can sign them. You can practice a secure software supply chain on them, just like you can infrastructure as code or anything that's an OCI image. The last practice is real-time access checks. So we like to say, done correctly, authorization is a distributed systems problem. Why? Because unlike login, which happens once a session, so it can, it can take 500 milliseconds a second, you amortize that over the entire session. Authorization, on the other hand, is in the critical path of every application request. So you can take a 100 millisecond or even a 50 millisecond network round trip to find out whether a user has a permission on a resource. That authorizer has to run close to your application. That means it's either deployed as a sidecar, if you need a millisecond authorization latency, that's your budget, or maybe you know, like it's de deployed as a microservice in the same, the same region, the same Kubernetes cluster, if you're okay with 10 milliseconds. Um, but you know, everything, all the decisions have to be computed over local data. At the same time, you want to authorize locally but manage centrally. You want a central control plane to manage all the artifacts uh, that are used for authorization. So as an example, users, groups, group memberships, the source of truth for that is an identity provider. You want to be able to flow any changes all the way out to the edge authorizers so that they have uh, all the up-to-date information. Likewise, policies are stored in versions in source control. You want to build them into immutable images and then distribute them to all of the uh, edge authorizers. And lastly, I'm not going to touch too much on this topic, but it's an important topic, decision logs. Fine-grained decision logs basically allow you to find out everything that a user did, uh, and those are super important for compliance and forensics. You want to be able to centralize those into the control plane as well. So again, done correctly. Uh, authorizations is a distributed systems problem. So now let me talk about the state of affairs today, the state of the ecosystem in cloud native authorization and what the open source landscape is. We have two centers of gravity. The policy is code camp, which is the ABAC camp. The open policy agent is basically the torch bearer for that, uh, you know, that world. It's the uh, successor to Exacmo, and there's a lot to like about it. It's a mature, graduated, open source uh, CNCF project that's been graduated for three and a half years now. Uh, it's a general purpose, flexible engine, and uh, it really is uh, tailor-made for ABAC, but there are some uh, disadvantages too. Uh, first of all, the language, Rego, has a little bit of a high learning curve around it. Uh, it gives you, it has no opinions, so it doesn't give you any help in modeling your domain. And lastly, um, it has a good policy plane, but it really has no data plane. So figuring out how to bring data to the engine is an exercise left to the reader. Uh, that's a big problem. Um, alternatives here include Casbin, which is a favorite uh, Go uh, project, uh, Cedar, which comes out of uh, the AWS folks, and a few others. The policy as data camp is the opposite. Whereas policy as code, ABAC systems are mostly stateless, policy as data, Reback says no, authorization is all about the state. The relationships between the subjects and objects need to be stored by the authorizer. It's got almost the opposite trade-offs, right? So first of all, it's a very opinionated model. Uh, OPA has no opinions, Zanzibar is very opinionated, and it's really tailor-made for being able to answer questions like the Google Drive question. Does this user have read permission on this particular document? By uh, modeling all of these resources, including parents and containment and, and so on and so forth. Uh, on the negative side, Google didn't open source anything. They didn't even write a spec. They wrote a technical report. And so there are half a dozen competing open source implementations uh, around how to do Zanzibar. Each one of them has a different schema language and a data language. And it's kind of hard to go outside of the strict reback model. Few alternatives here, OpenFGA is one of them. Uh, that's a CNCF sandbox project. But um, I'm partial to Topaz, which is in full disclosure, the project that my company sponsors and is the maintainer of. Topaz, we like to say, is the best of both worlds. We're seeing that, uh, you know, kind of that technique emerge. You, you, won't, you don't want to ask, uh, you know, do I need this or that? You, want, you actually need both of them. You want OPA as the ABAC side, and you want a Zanzibar-style directory. We've linked them both together into a single open source project, and I'm going to use that uh, for the demos naturally here. Um, before I get to the demo, I want to go through um, you know, one last thing here, which is discussion of enforcement points. Okay, so externalize my authorization, got it. 
where do I actually call this thing from, right? So, you know, the first thing is during the authentication ceremony. Yes, I poo-pooed the idea of using scopes in access tokens as permissions, and yes, I don't advocate that that is a best practice, but that is a common practice, and that's your first line of defense in a zero-trust, defense-in-depth architecture. So the first thing that you can do, your React app can, as it's, you know, logging in, it can talk to you know, the identity provider, that can call a Topaz authorizer, get back a set of scopes to put in the access token, and put that in the JWT. Now that that's done, the second line of defense is the API gateway. So you're gonna make a call using the JOT into uh, the API gateway, that's where it's gonna be intercepted by a filter, and you can basically then check whether this user can execute or can invoke this particular endpoint. So this is what I call medium-grained authorization. You don't have, you know, kind of like it's not as fine-grained as a resource level, but at least it gives you the ability to uh, consistently enforce whether users can invoke uh, these endpoints in your, um, in your uh, across your API estate, right? And typically this is made easier because you have a machine-readable description, like an open API spec or a protobuf or something uh, for your service. And lastly, if that check passes, you can then um, forward that request to the, you know, the service, the API. Typically, you'll abstract um, you know, kind of that authorization call using middleware from one of your uh, native languages, and then that middleware will call an external uh, authorization system like Topaz, uh, this time passing the JOT as the identity, and ask whether this identity has this permission on this particular resource, get an answer back, and then allow uh, or deny access to that, uh, that, that particular operation. So with that said, um, I'm gonna demo how to do this at the API level, uh, as opposed to the, 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 you know, kind of the application level. You can abstract what it looks like for the application. I have a QR code here, by the way, if people wanna follow along, there's a video for this, and there's a set of resources on, on how to do this. But the first thing that we're gonna do is import an open API spec. Um, which will uh, basically bring in all of the endpoints uh, from that open API spec and basically make the, that readback data, relationship-based data. Um, the second thing we're gonna do is set up a set of relationships. We're gonna have some protagonists, uh, you know, we like Rick and Morty, so Rick is gonna be the evil genius and uh, Morty's gonna be his uh, grand, grandson slash sidekick. Uh, and we're gonna set up these relationships that'll essentially entitle users or groups to access uh, these, these endpoints. And lastly, we're gonna enforce from the gateway. We picked Zuplo as an API gateway. It's a modern API gateway. It's also open API native, but you can do this with pretty much anything. Great, so I'm gonna get out of the slide deck here, switch over to, oh yeah, I got logged out. This is when we see whether the conference Wi-Fi works or not. <laughs> and it does, I think, I hope, uh, or not. Okay, great. So um, I've already instantiated one of our uh, templates here. Um, I'm using the Asserto uh, managed control plane here, but you can use Topaz, the open source uh, project. Uh, it has the same exact UI. Um, I have, I get ba basically a policy instance. That policy instance has some rego in it. So it's the simplest possible rego. It basically allows uh, the operation by delegating to the Zanzibar, the reback processor. And more, uh, more importantly, I can actually go add a, uh, I can import an open API spec. Here I have a uh, open API spec for a to-do application. I'm gonna actually grab the raw URL for that. Uh, go paste it in here, call this service kubecon uh, to do. Can everybody see this, by the way? Resolution-wise, it's good? Okay, excellent. Um, so it's found uh, a number of different endpoints. Uh, I'm actually not gonna import these twice. I already have them in here. Uh, but what that uh, will do is it will populate uh, the model. And we have basically have uh, an API authorization model that has a couple of resource types. One is a service and the other one is an endpoint. It's actually easier to, <laughs> for developers to read this uh, using the YAML as opposed to the graph here. Uh, so a service has a set of permissions and a set of relationships that grant those permissions through a, an algebra. Uh, and then an endpoint also has a permission called can invoke, which is granted through a set of 
either directly through an invoker relationship or through the parent relationship, the parent service relationships. Um, and we have a set of objects that we imported. So first of all, we have a set of services here. Uh, we have a pet store API. We have a to-do list API. We're going to deal with a to-do list here. It has uh, the six endpoints that I just showed, uh, deleting to-dos and uh, you know, getting to-dos, creating new to-dos, and so on. Um, and then uh, finally, we have a set of users. So the users uh, have been entitled in a particular manner. So Rick, for example, is the evil, evil genius. So he's a direct member of the global deleters group that has basically all of the HTTP methods um, you know, across all these, uh, these APIs, including the to-do list uh, and so on and so forth. And then um, uh, Morty, he's not a super user. He is just a regular user. Uh, he's a member of the editor group. The editor group is a member of the viewer group. The viewer group has uh, read access to all the to-do list API. So this is how you can actually go and title users. Um, now, finally, let's go to our uh, Zooplo portal, which is you know, kind of the API gateway that I chose to do this, uh, this demo with. And we're going to try to invoke. Uh, the first thing I did was I set up a filter here, uh, which calls out to the Asserto system um, right before granting or denying access to that particular uh, request. So I'm going to go invoke this particular API uh, using, first of all, Rick's bear token. Now remember, Rick is the evil genius, so we can do everything. I'll go click on test here, and we got a 200 OK. Uh, if I use Morty's uh, bear token here uh, and try to do the same thing, that should fail with a 403 because Morty is not a evil genius, a global deleter. But you know, oh, we, like let's go de demonstrate what real-time authorization looks like. Let's entitle Morty to uh, break the glass access against this API. So I'm going to go find the delete API here. Here it is. Um, I am going to make Morty. I could make Morty uh, one of the groups that Morty is a member of, uh, uh, an invoker of this, but I'm going to actually entitle Morty himself. I'm going to add this relationship. I'm going to go back to the Zoopla portal. I'm going to click test again. And sure enough, I have a 200 OK. So you know, I very easily was able to, in real time, authorize Morty on this particular API. And, and likewise, I can go with one click of a button here, or a API call, uh, more likely, uh, revoke access for Morty. I can go click on test again, and of course, uh, now he is forbidden. Now, why is this a big deal? It's a big deal because now all of the relationships are known to the system. So I can actually ask all sorts of governance um, you know, kind of questions. Let's find all the users that can access a particular endpoint. So let's go uh, look at for the same endpoint, the delete endpoint that we just talked about, uh, and see who can invoke it. If I invoke that, um, it's just Rick, right? So, and likewise, I can ask the exact opposite question. For Beth, for example, what endpoints can she invoke? I get back a list. And of course, all of this is, you know, kind of something that you can automate um, and use uh, an API for. So I can issue a curl here and get back the same results. So um, you're basically, you know, you're starting to get a glimpse of how I can create a whole workflow for all of my APIs as the new open API specs drop, I can basically push the definitions out into a centralized authorization system like Topaz or Asserto and entitle people based on group membership that they have in, say, my IDP. That's basically the workflow that I'm advocating for here. So just to you know, kind of bring this home, because I have only a couple of minutes left, um, Going through the what we call the principles of cloud native authorization. If you're trying to build one of these at home, I strongly suggest you follow you know, the following principles. You want to make it fine-grained, policy-based, real-time. We've already talked about those. I won't um, keep pushing on them. You want to make it centrally managed, and you want to make sure they collect decision logs for compliance and forensics, super important uh, for large, uh, large organizations. And then from a non-functional perspective, I have requirements like you want to be able to authorize super simple. Uh, so that it's easier for a developer to actually use your, the middleware than to actually roll out their own. You want it to integrate with everything you have, API gateways and identity providers and so on and so forth. And lastly, you want to make it based on open source and, and open technologies like OPA, Topaz, and OCI. So this is Topaz. This is the project that I was quickly demoing here. It's a QR code. Uh, we like to say it's fast, flexible, and easy. 
Topaz does authorization in under a millisecond. It's flexible. It does all the backs, A back, R back, re back, or any combination. And it's uh, easy to uh, incorporate. Uh, you bring it in in under five minutes, or your next one's free, as you like to say. Um, Lastly, uh, I know that I don't really have time for questions, uh, but if you want to find me, here's a QR code with my schedule. Just schedule some time. I'm giving two other talks, uh, one about AuthZen, which I forward referenced um, you know, uh, a few minutes ago, one about the uh, Policy Engines showdown Friday at 2 p.m. And you can find me uh, at the uh, CNCF Project Kiosk area, 17B, on Thursday between 1.30 and 5 p.m. Uh, and if you want to connect on Slack or uh, just you know, schedule some time outside of KubeCon, those are my socials. So thank you so much, and have a great rest of your app DevCon. <laughs> Mike, back on. <laughs> All right, any questions? Nobody, nobody really? Not at all at the same time. Yes, man with a red shirt. Oh, um, all right. You'll want to come up to the mic too so it gets recorded. Um, so that demo you showed yes. where you could see who had permissions to so forth, that was using the reback model but wasn't taking into account any of the caveats that might be in the Rego. Is that, that correct? That's exactly correct. Okay, great. You're exactly right. Now, we do have uh, some work, uh, some, some stuff in the works that will actually incorporate the uh, what you called caveats, which is a spicy DB term, uh, but you know what we call like the policy part of the, the evaluation to be able to take that into account as well. But that's a very astute observation. The reback model allows you to you know do searches on the graph. Um, if you want to go outside of that, then you know that's a more complicated procedure. Yes. So if I want to do this in a kind of B two B play, is there a way to make it so it's more multi tenant so that each customer of mine has their own space to play in? Yes. So we have a, you know, a, every project, every authorization system does it differently, but Asserto has a multi-tenant directory, a multi-tenant authorizer, so that you can basically map uh, every one of your customers' tenant, uh, every one of your tenants, as, you know, your customers into uh, a, an Asserto tenant that is isolated. So you can run, every tenant can run its own model if you want to, uh, and its own policy if you want to as well. Okay, not, not to steal time, but just a second question. You gave a great example for a back-end service, which is the majority of what most of us do. I get that. What if it is not a back-end service? What if it's um, Temporal or Pulsar or some other s system, not necessarily a service? Do you have integrations for that? Great question. Um, and the answer is uh, it, it all depends. So we, for example, built systems that will map, that will shadow, like, say, all the permissions in Google Drive. So that you can do things like um, retrieval augmented generation uh, that takes permissions into account. And so there are integrations you know, with various systems. We have a, you know, an ETL, open source ETL pipeline called uh, DS load that allows you to essentially flow uh, permission changes into the Asura directory so that you can keep those in sync. But there's no magic here, right? You're either gonna have to, uh, you know, kind of like, have a source of truth and then flow that into an extract database that is your authorization system, or you're going to treat your authorization system as a source of truth. Another question? Yeah, question. Um, there we go. Yep. Uh, you showed uh, authorization at the API level for granting access and being able to invoke. Uh, have you done anything with taking it a step further where they would have access to invoke the API but may not have ac should not have access to certain elements that would come back as part of a response from that API? That's an awesome question as well. You can definitely put a response filter and do some filtering, um, although I would say that the system that I demoed here is like supposed to be lightweight and turnkey so that it really does things at the endpoint level. We certainly have customers that have written more sophisticated filters where they've even figured out the resource context from you know, whether it's a payload or whether it's a URL you know, component or something like that. Maybe it comes from a header. And they're able to go corral that information, make a call to the uh, authorizer, and actually do fine-grained access control, and then do filtering on the way back. So I would say the trade-offs on whether you do it in the app or API itself or whether you do it at the gateway are, you know, like the gateway is a big hammer, right? So the nice thing about the gateway is you can enforce, uh, you know, a layer of security across all of your APIs in a very consistent manner 
without having any access to the source code. But really, you know, in my opinion, there is no substitute for actually having ultimately the, the code itself, the API code itself, do its own uh, fine-grained authorization because only that code knows for sure what needs to happen, like what, what is the resource. For example, some APIs will get some ID, go fish out something from a database, and have something you know, that comes back that is required, like that is really the required context to make that uh, authorization call. That's not something that you want the gateway to do. The gateway needs to execute in a small number of milliseconds, uh, whereas the application can do a little bit more pro uh, processing. So that's why I say you can use something like Topaz both for API authorization at the gateway level as well as uh, for, you know, at, the, at the API itself. Do we have any other, do you have more time or are we all done with questions? I think we're out of time, says Mark, so we're out of time. All right, thank you so much.